All right, welcome back. Let's start with this example. We have find the absolute extrema for the given function on the given interval for the function x squared plus 2x minus 4 on the interval from negative 1 to 1. Now, if you're not familiar with the process of finding these absolute extrema, feel free to watch our lesson video on this topic where we explain this in depth, but I am still going to go over the steps here as we solve this problem. So the first thing we're going to want to do is to find our critical numbers. And our critical numbers are where our function has a slope of zero. So what we're going to do is we're going to find a derivative of our function, and that's going to represent our slope, and then set the derivative equal to zero and solve for those values of x. So if we do that, we'll have f prime of x is equal to the derivative of x squared, which is going to be 2x, plus the derivative of 2x, which is just going to be plus 2, and then the derivative of negative 4, which is 0, because the derivative of a constant is 0. So then if we set this derivative equal to 0, we can then solve for our values of x, and that will give us our critical numbers for this function. So we'll have 0 equals 2x plus 2. I'm going to subtract 2x from both sides, so we'll have negative 2x equals positive 2, and then we'll divide both sides by negative 2, and we'll have x equals negative 1. And so that's going to be our critical number for this function, or more specifically, where our function has a slope of zero on this interval. But you'll notice that this negative one is actually the same as one of our endpoints, because the next step that we go through here to find our absolute extrema is to plug in the value of our critical number into our function to find its y output, and then we will plug in our endpoints to find their y outputs, and then we compare those values of y to see which one is the maximum and which one is the minimum. But since the critical number we found is the same as one of our endpoints, we really only have to plug in the endpoints in this case. So we really didn't get any new values to test, so we still just test the endpoints. So we'll start by checking negative 1. So we have x equals negative 1. And if we plug in negative 1 into our function, we will have that this is equal to negative 1 squared plus 2 times negative 1 minus 4. And that will be equal to 1 minus 2 minus 4. And that is negative 5. And then if we plug in positive 1, f of 1, or the original function, right, we're plugging this value, just like we did for this one, into our original function. We will have 1 squared plus 2 times 1 minus 4. So we'll have 1 plus 2, which is 3 minus 4, and that will give us negative 1. And so now we compare our two y values here. We see that we have negative 5 and negative 1. Whichever one is greater is going to be our max on this interval and whichever one is smaller is going to be our minimum. So that means that negative one is going to be our minimum and x equals one is going to be our maximum. So in this case, this is going to be our answer. For this function on this particular interval, our absolute maximum is at x equals one and our absolute minimum is at x equals negative one. And of course, if you wanted to, you could also create their coordinates by writing negative one comma negative five or one comma negative one, right? You could also make them into their coordinates if you wanted to have the full point. Let's look at another example. So for our next example, we want to do the same thing. We want to find the absolute extrema for the given function on the given interval. In fact, all the rest of these problems are going to have the same instructions. We're gonna be doing the same process, but just with different functions and different intervals. So this time we have eight x plus three on the interval from zero to six. So let's find a derivative and then set it equal to zero. So we'll have f prime of x is equal to eight because the derivative of eight x will be eight and derivative of three is going to be zero because three is a constant. So now this is a little bit tricky because now we can't solve for any values of x, right? So if we set this equal to zero, uh, we just get a statement that's not true, right? Zero is not equal to eight, so this isn't gonna tell us anything. So because we have no values of x to solve for, there are no critical numbers, and so we just have to plug in the endpoints in this scenario. And if you think about this, this makes sense because 8x plus 3 is going to be a linear function. And so if you were to look at the graph, it would just be a straight line that increases forever. So there would be no point on that function where the slope would be 0. It's always going to be 8, which is why we found the derivative was 8. So no matter where we are, it's going to be 8. But on this interval from zero to six, we can still have a maximum and a minimum. So let's plug in our endpoints and see what we can find. So for x equals zero, if we plug zero into our function, we'll have f of zero is equal to eight times zero plus three, and that's going to be equal to three, right? And then if we check our other endpoint, we'll have x equals six, We'll have f of 6 is equal to 8 times 6 plus 3. That's going to be 48 plus 3. So we will have 51. And so in this case, if we compare our y values here, 51 is a lot bigger than 3. 
So that means that x equals 6 is going to be our maximum, and x equals 0 is going to be our minimum. And so that would be the answer to this question. How about the function x cubed minus 27x on the interval 0 to 4? Where are our absolute extrema on this function? Well, let's start by taking its derivative, and then we'll go from there. So we'll have f prime of x is equal to 3x squared, right? That's just using our power rule. And then we're going to have negative 27. Derivative of negative 27x is just negative 27. And so now let's set this equal to 0 and solve for our values of x and find any potential critical numbers. So we'll have 0 equals 3x squared minus 27. If we add 27 to both sides, we'll have 27 equals 3x squared. I'll divide both sides by 3 and we'll have 9 equals x squared. And then of course if we take the square root of both sides, x is going to be equal to positive or negative 3. Now, look at our interval though. We are on an interval from 0 to 4, so we don't need to worry about our negative value of 3 here. So really, it's just going to be positive 3. And so now we have three points to check. We have the critical number we found, x equals 3, and then we have our two endpoints, x equals 0 and x equals 4. And so if we were to plug each of these into our function, and let's start with x equals 3, we're going to get f of 3 is equal to 3 cubed minus 27 times 3, and that's going to be equal to negative 54. And then if we plug 0 into our function, we will have 0 cubed minus 27 times 0, so that's just going to be equal to 0. And then if we plug in 4, we'll have f of 4, and that's going to be equal to 4 cubed minus 27 times 4, and that will be equal to negative 4. 44. And you can check my work on that if you'd like. And so now we can compare the values of y that we got for each of our x values, right? We had our critical value of 3, we had our two endpoints, and we got the following value. So 0 is going to be the greatest value here because the rest of them are negative. And so that means that x equals 0 is going to be our max. And then if we compare our other two values, one of these has to be a minimum. And negative 54 is a lot less than negative 44, which makes x equals 3 our minimum. And so that would be the answer in this case. Our maximum is at x equals 0, or the point 0, 0, and our minimum is at x equals 3, or the point 3, negative 54, on this function for the given interval. Next, we have f of x equals the cube root of x, and we want to find its absolute extrema on the interval from negative 8 to 8. And so in this case, we're going to first redefine our function, so we'll have f of x is equal to x to the 1 third power, and that's going to make it easier for us to use our power rule to take the derivative here. So f prime of x is going to be equal to 1 third x, and then we'll subtract 1 from the exponent, and that's actually all there is to our derivative, and we'll have that this equals 1 third times x to the negative 2 thirds power. And if we move this to the denominator, we can make this exponent positive, so we'll have that this is equal to 1 divided by 3x to the 2 thirds power power. And now notice what happens here if we set this derivative equal to 0. What's going to happen here? Well, if I want to try and solve for x, I'm not going to be able to, right? So this actually has no solutions. There is no value of x that you can plug in here to get the value of 0. 1 divided by anything is going to be something. It's never going to be 0. And the answer can't be x equals 0 because 0 in the denominator would create an undefined value. And so there's no way for our derivative to equal 0. And so we're not going to have any critical numbers to check this time, but we do still have the endpoints, and so that's what we're going to check. So we'll start with x equals negative 8, and then we'll move on to x equals 8. And if we plug in negative 8, f of negative 8, that's going to be equal to the cubed root of negative 8, which is going to be equal to negative 2. And if we plug in x equals 8, so we'll have f of 8, that's going to be equal to the cubed root of 8, and that's equal to positive 2. And so if we compare our two y values here that we just found, 2 is greater than negative 2. And so that means that x equals 8 is going to be our maximum, and then that means that negative 8 would be our minimum value on this interval. And so that would be the answer in this case. Since 2 is the larger value of y, this is our maximum, and that means that negative 2 is the lesser value. That makes this our minimum. So the point 8, 2, or negative 8, negative 2. Let's look at another example. All right, so our next function is just secant x, and we're on the interval from negative pi over 4 to positive pi over 3. And let's start this by taking the derivative of our function. We'll have that f prime of x is equal to the derivative of secant x, and we know that derivative of secant x is going to be secant x tangent x, or secant times tangent. 
And if we set this equal to zero, so we'll have zero equals to secant x tangent x, we can try to find our critical numbers. Now, this is gonna be a little bit difficult in its current form, so let's try to actually simplify this a little bit by rewriting our trig functions using some identities. So we'll have that zero equals one over cosine x, right? That's what secant is equal to, one divided by cosine. And we know that we can rewrite tangent to be sine x divided by cosine x. And so then if we simplify this, we'll have that zero is equal to sine x divided by cosine squared x, right? Cosine times cosine will be cosine squared x, and we just have sine times one on the top. So that leaves us with sine. And then if we're going to solve for x, we just have to multiply both sides by this cosine squared x term, and we'll be left with zero equals sine x. And so now we just have to ask ourselves, where is sine equal to zero on this interval? Well, we know that sine is going to be equal to zero on intervals of pi. So we'd have zero, pi, two pi, three pi, and so on. But in this case, our interval stops at pi over three. So that's going to be before pi. So in fact, the only value that is going to matter here is x equal to zero. So we know that if we plug zero into the sine function, we will get zero out. And so in this case, our only solution on this interval is going to be x equals zero. So even though pi and two pi would get you zero, they are not included in the interval that we are interested in. And so now we have a critical number of x equals zero, and we have our two endpoints to check to see where our absolute minimum and our absolute maximum are going to be. So we'll start by checking x equals zero, and if we plug zero into the secant function, we are going to get an output of one, and then if we move on to our next value of x, we'll have x equals negative pi over four, which is our first endpoint here. We're starting with our lower endpoint. And if we plug negative pi over four into secant, right, we have f of negative pi over four. That's going to be equal to the square root of two. And then for our last endpoint, we have x equals pi over three. If we plug in pi over three into our function, or in particular, if we plug it into secant x, we are going to get the result of two. Now, if you're curious where those came from, you could just plug it into your calculator to get these values, or you could think about it as secant is equal to one over cosine. So if you plug each of these values into cosine and then take the reciprocal of that value, you would get each of these, right? Cosine of zero is equal to one. So the reciprocal of one is just one. Cosine of negative pi over four is going to be the square root of two divided by two. But if you take the reciprocal of that, you would just end up with the square root of two. And if you plug in pi over three into cosine, you would get one half. And the reciprocal of one half would be two divided by one or just two. And so now we can compare these y values to see what the minimum and the maximum is. Now, in order to do this, we kind of have to know the decimal value of the square root of two. Although if you think about it, the square root of two has to be smaller than two because the square root of two would be a number multiplied by itself to get you two. So it's going to be a smaller number, right? So we can declare that x equals pi over three would be our maximum value. But our minimum is going to be a little harder because we need to know the exact value of the square root of two. And so if you plug that into your calculator, you would find that the square root of two is about 1.414. And there's some more decimals, but that's the approximate value. And so one is going to be less than this value, which means that x equals zero is going to be our absolute minimum on this given interval. And so those are the two values we were looking for in this problem. We wanted to find the absolute extra, and so we found the absolute maximum is at x equals pi over three, or the point pi over three comma two. And we found the absolute minimum was at x equals zero, or the point zero comma one. Let's look at one more final example. Finally, we wanna find the absolute extrema for the function 2x divided by x squared plus one on the interval negative two to two. So let's start by taking the derivative of our function and then we'll set it equal to zero and we'll go from there. So we'll have f prime of x is equal to, and this is going to require using the quotient rule for derivatives because we have the quotient of two functions, right? 2x is divided by x squared plus one. So let's go through our quotient rule here and it shouldn't be too difficult if we remember our steps. And so the first step is to write down our original bottom function or the denominator function. So we'll have x squared plus one and that's gonna be multiplied by the derivative of the top function or the numerator function. And the derivative of two x will be two, so we'll multiply by two. And now we're going to subtract the original top function, two x multiplied by the derivative of our bottom function. And so the derivative of x squared would be two x, and the derivative of one is just zero, so it's zero plus two x, so we just have two x times two x. And then the denominator is just going to be our original bottom function squared. So we'll have x squared plus one 
squared. And so if we set this equal to zero, if we set our derivative equal to zero, we're not going to care about the denominator, right? If we're gonna to try to solve for a value of x that makes this derivative equal to zero, we're only gonna be interested in the numerator because the numerator is the only part of the function that has the ability to make the derivative equal to zero. And that's because you can't divide by anything and end up with zero. So we do not care about the denominator. So all we're gonna be left with when setting this equal to zero is the top part of our function. So we're gonna have x squared plus one times two minus 4x squared, which came from multiplying 2x times 2x. And so then let's distribute this two through this quantity. So we'll have zero is equal to 2x squared plus two minus 4x squared. And then we can simplify that and we'll have that zero equals negative 2x squared plus two, right? We just added together our like terms to get negative 2x squared plus two. And so now we can add 2x squared to both sides and we'll have 2x squared equals two, and we can divide by two, so we'll have x squared equal to one, and then the square root of both sides will give us x equals plus or minus one. And in this case, both of these values are going to be valid because our interval is from negative two to two, which includes both negative one and positive one. So now that we have our critical values, let's work on finding our absolute extrema. So I'm gonna clean up this page a little bit. So we found that our critical numbers are one and negative one, and we also know that we need to test our endpoints to see if they are going to be the absolute extrema as well. And so let's start with x equals one. If we plug in x equals one, we'll have f of one, and that will be equal to two times one divided by one squared plus one, and that will be equal to two on the top, and then one plus one, so two, and that's just gonna be two divided by two, and so that will be equal to one. And then if we try x equals negative one, and we plug that into our original function, that's gonna be equal to two times negative one, divided by negative one squared plus one, and that's just going to be equal to negative one. And so now that we have checked our critical numbers, let's check our endpoints to see what their y values will be, and then we will compare them all and see what our max and min are. And so let's start with x equals negative two. We'll start with that lower endpoint on our interval. And if we plug in negative two into our function, we'll find that it is equal to two times negative two divided by negative two squared plus one. And that's going to be equal to negative four on the top. And then in the bottom, we're going to have negative two squared, which would be four. And then four plus one is five, which gives us a denominator of five. And so our answer is negative four fifths. And then if we check our other endpoint, x equals positive two, and we plug that into our function, we'll have f of two is equal to two times two divided by two squared plus one. And that's gonna be equal to four on the top and then positive five on the bottom to get an answer of four fifths. So now we have all of our y values for our critical points and our endpoints, and now we can compare them to each other to see who has the highest y value and the lowest y value. And we'll use that to determine the absolute max and the absolute minimum. And so if I look at these values here, we have one, negative one, negative four fifths and four fifths, one is going to be the greatest in this case, right? Because out of all of our values, one and four fifths are our only positive values and four fifths is less than one. And so since four fifths is less than one, then we can conclude that X equals one is going to be our maximum in this case. And so we'll say that this is the maximum or the absolute maximum for this interval. And then if we compare our negative values, we have negative one and negative four fifths. Those are the smallest values in this case. Negative one is going to be smaller than negative four fifths. And so we can say that X equals negative one would be our minimum or our absolute minimum for this interval. And so that is going to be our answer. We have our two absolute extrema on our interval from negative two to two. And so our coordinate for the maximum value would be one comma one and the coordinate for our minimum value would be negative one comma negative one. And that is the last example I had for this video. So if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments and I will get around to answering those. But if you don't have any questions, this is all I have for now. So I will see you next time.